Found and Lost by Theo Plesha I don't have a lot of time to get this all typed up and out there. I barely escaped, and they're looking for me. I hope this gets out. If you see it, make sure it goes viral so people know what's really happening. I was the foreman working on Thorn Grove, the new elementary school site. I'm going to try to explain this in a way that makes the most sense because it barely makes any sense to me. We were doing shift change and head counts as the graveyard crew left and the morning crew came on. Shane, the night shift supervisor, was having the same problem I was. Some folks weren't showing up when they were supposed to. My problem was less interesting since we got no calls, no shows all the time, but he was having a difficult time locating people on the site. He was blurry-eyed from the night and I was frustrated because time was just getting wasted. Eventually, we got distracted by some commotion on the far end of the site. We started to trot over to where the yelling was coming from. Then Shane rushed up his huge cargo pants and started spilling excuses about trying to settle his daughter down and get her off to school after she lost her beloved stuffed animal. I told him we'd talk about it as my trot became a full-on dash as a cluster of five night shift guys were hauling over metallic containers, roughly the size of a 30-quart chest cooler. For all I knew, it was the freaking Ark of the Covenant. Shane and I called for an order while the workers tried to explain what they had found. They said they hid it with their backhoe bucket shuffle. I didn't believe them because the object, though dirty, looked completely intact and the tines on the bucket would have certainly pierced the strongest metal cooler. Unless, of course, it was solid titanium. Which it couldn't be since only two men were able to haul it off well over 50 yards seemingly without issue. While I tried to settle them down, the backhoe operator tossed down two dirt encrusted prongs of metal. I instantly recognized them as the metal tines of the backhoe bucket. This object now had my complete attention. They brushed away the dirt on all sides and although it was silvery like metal, it had more of like a graphite dullness and shapelessness to it. The sides bore no sides of the impact from the shovel and no markings of any other kind. Construction gloves wiped the top clear in sections. The top part read, Thorn Grove Elementary School Discovery Expansion 2052. One of the workers immediately gasped and said it was a time capsule not to be opened until 2052. Another worker pointed out that it was possibly for a new school they were building. And then Shane chimed in that it was probably an expansion that wasn't in the plans quite yet. One of the workers pointed out the lack of seam or any kind of latch to open this thing. He flipped over the impervious metallic crate. It seemingly moved with ease. He brushed off the bottom which read, Thorn Grove Elementary School Discovery Expansion 2052. Do not open until 2102. One of the workers who stood with his arms crossed over his chest and his wrap around sunglasses reflecting the morning sun shook his head, saying it had to be a prank. It would have been one hell of an expensive prank though. It would have been made out of some sort of experimental graphene material to do what it did to the backhoe and remain intact. Either it was an elaborate prank or we're looking at a time capsule but one from the future. Shane argued his men should open it, but as I already mentioned, the box was solid all the way around, with only markings on the top and bottom. That's when the worker who came in late, Peter Red, took out his phone and started to take pictures. As he circled the box and the other men crowded around, it must have triggered the auto flash on his phone's camera and something about the flash triggered the box. The top of the box seemed to slither off in quarters onto the four corners, revealing a soap bubble-like membrane separating the contents from the open air. The best analogy I could make about the technology and how the capsule opened was that it was unsealed and globed away like the liquid metal Terminator from Terminator 2. The cooler was filled with all kinds of strange objects. There was something that looked like a Rubik's Cube married to some sort of disc ball roughly two inches cubed. There was a collection of four cylinders made of material that seemed to be translucent. It's hard to really explain, you know? Each of these things were labeled H2O and ATMOS. I can only guess they were air and water samples from the future. 
There was a device that vaguely looked like headphones but looked narrower. Like it might grip onto someone's neck. I could make out the snowflake symbol on the two pads and I speculated that maybe it was some kind of personal air conditioner. There was a circular item that bore a passing resemblance to a pacifier, but the mouthpiece was hollow, with two short hoses that separated out into a lima bean shaped pad that looked like a combination of an earbud or a foam ear protector. Thoughtlessly, one of the workers reached through the membrane and started to grab the various objects out. One by one, the unusual devices were grabbed or spilled out of the membrane onto the ground and mauled by the workers until the capsule was empty. Then Shane grabbed the box and seemed to lead a mass exodus off the property. We, we didn't even make it halfway through the parking lot. Some sort of armed forces in black and silver uniforms swamped us. They were clad in some sort of armor, motorcycle-like helmets and reflective visors and respirators. One of them had a red stripe on his chest, and I instantly recognized him as an officer because his head was twisting back and forth. I couldn't hear them communicating, and I assumed somehow they had sealed communication links between them. The officer's helmet, visor, and respiratory gear turned mostly transparent. His eyes were locked with mine, and he started to bark some sort of command. He told us to remain calm and still that he was declaring a possible biohazardous incident and we couldn't leave until we were cleared. For men who fought their way into diners during COVID lockdowns and, and thought they won the lottery with tech from the future, this didn't sit well. They started shoving and darting away for a different way out. The officer shouted a command, Have it your way, no commentantum. Two of his troopers raised and fired a grenade launcher into the air. The shell split into multiple ping pong sized ball spheres that popped like fireworks dousing us with a white powder that knocked us out cold. All of the crew, Shane, Peter, the five others and I woke up shivering and in pain in an orange tent with bright lights overhead and the sound of rushing air. The entrance of the tent was guarded by two heavily armed guards. We were separated from them by a thin inner section of the tent with a transparent airlock liner that reached most of the way around the tent. There were a series of cameras with a sort of reddish spotlight on them. They were periodically scanning over us and relaying medical information like heart rate and O2 levels to a series of monitors on the other side of the airlock. A voice came over a non-existent loudspeaker. It asked us to slowly regain our feet and to take the pills on the table in the middle of the tent if we were feeling anxious or achy. It explained that we were subjected to a fentanyl-based knockout agent similar to what the Russians used in the Moscow Theater Siege, and Narcan was used to revive us, but the whole experience could result in uncomfortable side effects which the pills could relieve. All of us started to shout to someone to tell us what was going on. The voice said the officer in command would be with us shortly. Indeed, the officer stood in the monitoring section of the tent with his face revealed to us. Something about the material the tent was made of revealed that the face he was displaying was of a false image, which made sense to me because this was some sort of ultra-secret operation. But the fact that no one was actually showing their faces made me feel better about my chances of surviving. In heist movies, you were dead if you showed your face, or whoever saw it was dead. There was no in-between. The officer explained that we had discovered an anti-chrono artifact, basically an object for reasons not explained to us that travels backwards in time. The nature of the artifact and its time period now breached by us had biological considerations. Future strains of the flu, future strains of COVID, future strains of the common cold, or even future novel viruses altogether we may not have even discovered. They were required by code to hold us until any pathogens could be identified and determined if they were infected. Under no circumstances could we leave until that process was complete because the future of humanity was at stake, allegedly. He assured us that the tent was inescapable and he would not risk letting us go after our first reaction. He said the tent was constructed around us with virtually no contact between us and his men. They told us to stay put and hopefully we'd make it out alive. We waited for hours. It was probably around noon when the officer came back and addressed me, me specifically, by name. He insisted he would speak to me. The officer told me something that I still don't fully understand. He said the time capsule was an anti-chrono artifact and was shielding regular chrono effects, essentially carrying them back in time. 
so long as they remained within the capsule. The capsule's exterior was set to 0 .000001 standard units, which he relayed to me as it would, or in this case should, have only intersected with our perceivable present for one hour. He sighed when he said that none of this should have happened, and none of this would have happened if my men had dug in that area about one minute before, or about 60 minutes after shift change. The capsule would have been in our future by 60 minutes still, or our past by the smallest unit of time. Either way, it would not have been there the time we were digging. He continued by saying that something had gone wrong because the time capsule had not disappeared from our present. He said it was stuck, and it was because the time capsule was missing something. Something his men didn't manage to collect while we were on the ground and before the isolation tent went up. He reiterated that, as of now, we had some time. He believed the capsule was stable in our time for at least another hour, but after that he said that something bad was going to happen. He said something like Hitler could win World War II, I could never be born, or the Big Bane Theory might not happen at all. Everything could potentially disappear because something, in that case, needed to keep going back in time. He told me he believed I could figure out and talk to whoever was holding something and maybe get them to surrender it. In the meantime, the officer told me he was running temporal correlations to the incident facets and there was no guarantee they would produce results in the time allotted. He suggested I start asking people with connections to the area, specifically this field before it became the construction site for the school. The alternative was that he'd kill us all and risk contaminating himself to find the object. He said as far as the world, the public, and our families outside of the construction site were concerned, they were informed that there was a hazmat accident on site and that the area was off limits with unknown casualties, yet he suggested I take any action I deemed necessary to keep it that way. As the officer left, I turned around to see my employees, my family, huddled on the other side of the tent. They lifted their heads and stared me down with suspicion. I respected them. I had been to some of their homes and even met most of their families. We played softball together and spent at least one solid 4th of July getting drunk together. I went to Peter's first child's funeral and was sort of close with his surviving daughter, Maggie. It occurred to me, though, that Peter was a newcomer to the area and had moved here for the project. My suspicions fell on Shane, who had lived here his whole life, but as I thought about it then, I wasn't sure how being local mattered. I gave everyone the cliff notes about what the officer had told me. I omitted certain details, chief among them was the alternative. I was met by loudness, mostly things I would have said. Who are these guys, really? Who does something like this? How can you even travel back to the past? The experts say a lot of things, etc. I let them exhaust themselves a bit before I straight asked them if anyone kept something they shouldn't have from the box. I reiterated the disease aspect that if they'd surrendered it now, we could all probably get out of here. I turned to Shane. He told me not to look at him. I told him I had reason to believe he had it. Whatever it was, he swore he only grabbed the capsule itself, and by the time he did, it was empty. It was then that one of the workers, Max, stepped up and yelled that if they wanted it so bad, they should come in and take it. He got applause from two others, including Peter. I told him this wasn't about that. That didn't stop Mac and Peter from taking swings at me. Shane and the other three then came and pushed them down and away. When the scuffle was said and done, there was a beanie baby-like toy on the floor. It was in the shape of a dachshund. I picked it up and Peter immediately came over to me and tried to look surprised. He said it was his daughter's stuffed animal that she lost, and he must have had it in his cargo pants the whole time. He tried to play it off like he found the toy she lost. I was about to hand it back to him when the stomach opened up and revealed a pouch. Beaming out of the pouch, in the eyes was a bright light and a message that read, Dad, I finally found it. I wish every single day I made a bigger fit that morning. Love you, Dad. Maggie. I held it for a second and tried to play it off like I hadn't seen the message. Something clicked in my mind, though. Something like when you know you have something horribly gone wrong, like, or if you have, like, beat somebody in poker really bad, but you don't want to show your excitement. I was about to ask Peter if he had been up here before, but I remembered when I brought him on, he said he used to bring his kids to the park nearby where the school was being built, and he was excited to move his family here and have a brand new school for them. Shortly afterwards, his son died. I realized that if... 
I kept going back in time. There was a chance someone in the past might have encountered it and taken something. Something like a stuffed dachshund with an eyeball hologram tech out of it. And maybe kept it. Why didn't it destroy the universe then? I wasn't so sure, but because of that, and I think that's entirely what happened, if it wasn't returned now, it would destroy the universe I was currently in because it would never make it back. It would still be here. I gripped the stuffed animal tightly and tossed it into the mini airlock and sealed it. The medical tech came by with a capsule and made the transfer and carried it out, presumably to be reburied and disappeared from our present and our future. I was bracing myself for Peter to come after me taking his daughter's toy, but instead, I saw Peter break down in tears as he slid down to the end of the tent, sobbing. Then it hit me. Dad, I finally found it. I wish I made a bigger fit that morning. Love, Maggie. In the future, Maggie would be affiliated in some way with the school's expansion product and the time capsule. The toy she recovered from the park as a younger child was finally made in the future, and she put that message into the capsule. But it was right on time. It couldn't have happened any other way. In under two hours, we were released from the quarantine monitoring tent, except Peter. Officially, the hazmat incident was us encountering a pocket of hydrogen sulfide gas while digging. All of us survived, except for Peter. We were compensated for the incident with the stipulation that we never discussed it. Doubts flooded my mind along with tears. It all started to break down in my head. I was guilty, so I started telling Peter's story, and now they're after me. I hope, if nothing else, people know the story of Peter. Skinwalker in Northern Oregon by... Death Raptor Gaming. Now, this isn't my first encounter here, but I'm glad I have a community to share it with to get their thoughts, as even my scientifically minded and rational fiance came up short when I explained what I heard to her. These memories were brought back after I sent in experiences with the hound where I live. I'll start by saying, that I'm an 18-year-old male who has encountered the supernatural since I was 8 years old, and I've had at least one experience every couple of years, so I've determined there must be some sort of cycle. I've already sent in my most recent encounter with a possible hellhound, which happened much earlier. This was back in November of 2022 when I visited a campground in Garibaldi, Oregon, on the coast with my choir class for a weekend excursion to get to know our classmates better. Our camp had two large story group cabins, several trails, a mess hall with a basement, and other amenities. I will not disclose the camp's name, but if you've been there, you've been there. The first day and night of the excursion went incredibly well. With us getting to know each other, me having horrible luck asking out the girl I liked, and overall having a good time with my friends. However, things changed dramatically when the sun went down. The atmosphere shifted, making everything eerie and unsettling. I didn't experience anything on the first night, but I was still very nervous. I'll quickly add here that me and my classmates had not seen a single animal during the entire trip, not even birds or squirrels, which was already bizarre. The next day was pretty typical, with our class going through all of our scheduled activities as the day went on. Dinner rolled around, and before I knew it, Everyone was back in the cabins and turning in for the night. However, I couldn't sleep for some reason. I decided it would be best to step outside onto the second story balcony to help take my mind off things. The dread was already coming back, as well as the feeling of eyes on me. The night was also deathly quiet, with only crashing waves on the beach accompanying me. But soon enough, that wasn't the only sound I was hearing. The sound came from the forest that ran parallel to the field that was divided by two cabins. It caused my body to immediately go into fight or flight and a chill ran down my spine. The sound in question was my voice coming from the tree line. Come here. I want to show you something. Whatever, whatever this thing was was trying to mimic my voice but it sounded slightly off, like it had been recorded and played back. I initially thought it was just a figment of my imagination, so I rubbed my ears hoping I would not hear it again, but alas it came. Come here. I want to show you something. It sounded exactly like it did before. 
I noped the heck out of there remembering the many stories I've heard of skimwalkers and how they can mimic voices. I ran into the cabin, closed that door that led to the balcony, locked it, closed all the windows, and hoped not to hear anything further. After some time, I fell asleep, and probably about an hour later, I woke up at 4 o'clock in the morning. I listened to a single, heavy footstep make contact with the bottom step of the metal stairs that led to the balcony. I ignored it and began blasting music into my earphones, drowning out any other noises. I hoped that would be it, but the climax came on our trip's third and final night. The next day, we went through the daily activities once more, and then once night fell again, we would be spending the last night of the trip playing assassin, basically hide and seek in the woods. Before we got together to play, a decent sized group of classmates and I were hanging out in one of the larger fields with a forest on three sides. We were laying out under the stars and all of us heard it at the same time. It was a loud, shrill screech, sounding like it was coming from very far away. I was reminded then that the further a skimwalker stays from you, the closer it really is. While the more it imitates sounds, the farther it is. We then formed a defensive circle with our flashlights on bright, scanning the field and tree line, looking for anything out of the ordinary. Yet we could locate absolutely nothing. It was tense for about a minute until our instructor and other students came towards our circle with their flashlights on, ready to play assassin. We were assigned our roles and began to play, entered the woods, and had a good time. Luckily, nothing really happened during the games and for the rest of our trip there, thank God. I need people to know that there are things out there that our kind can't even comprehend or explain. Please be careful when camping in the coastal forest of Oregon because there are things out there that will try to lure you into the woods, where you may never be found again. Something in the Bighorn Mountains by Cam I was younger when this story occurred. Of course, all the adults say kids have a wild imagination, even though my buddy and I swore up and down that this had happened. Anywho, let's get to the story. It was toward the end of the week, and my mom and her boyfriend at the time, I wanted to go up the mountain to his family's cabin. I live north of Wyoming where the Bighorn Mountains reside. As a 12 year old, I asked my mom if I could bring my buddy, for his safety, his name will be Nick. I called Nick and asked if he wanted to go to the cabin for the weekend. He had to ask his mom, and with our moms being close since they were younger, she said yes. Once we got everything in my mom's boyfriend's pickup, we went ahead and picked him up. As he hopped into the back of the truck, we talked about the general things that typically we would talk about, school, girls, etc. As we got to the cabin on the first day, Nothing really major happened. We went four-wheeling and had hot dogs and s'mores, and the first night came and went without incident. The start of the next day is when things began to get a little spooky. The day went normal as much as it could. Towards the afternoon, we stayed around the cabin. My mom kicked us out of the place after lunch. We hiked around the house, and we discussed a few different things, such as movies, shows, Call of Duty, etc., as well as grabbing a stick and pretending to be in Call of Duty, as weird as it may have sounded. Towards dusk, I showed him the treehouse, roughly 70 to 80 yards away from the cabin. The treehouse is a triangular platform 10 feet up in the air made of 2x4s and a makeshift ladder. The platform is between three trees on each point in a triangle shape, with rails to help with safety and all that. We had our legs dangling from the platform, talking again with the occasional silence between us talking. The forest became dead, which is a natural sign of a predator being around, which became a big red flag with both of us knowing that, especially with us going hunting every fall. We ended up getting the chills. Nick broke the silence. Hey, do you, do you see that? As he struggles to get the sentence out, so that's all the light we had. A feeling of fight or flight. With the sun setting and it being all the light we had, that feeling of fight or flight came through our bodies. We began to hear something crashing through the brush, and in the distance, we saw what I can only describe as a giant, 
hairy humanoid creature peering at us from behind a tree that was roughly 50 feet away from us. It was at least 9 feet tall. Once I realized what it could be, the hair on the back of our neck stood up immediately. Our first mistake was looking at each other as shock kicked in. We looked back at where the creature was and now it was a bit closer. It was kind of like suspense from those movies in like Jurassic Park when the raptor broke through the glass. We both hopped off and as I'm looking back and forth between Nick and the creature, he hopped down and ran to the meadow in front of the cabin, closer to where we were. Looking back at the beast, I saw it was about 30 yards away. Fear filled my body and I shook without looking away from the beast. I scooted my butt over as I was getting ready to run when I happened to look up and saw this thing face to face. I saw it in its full glory, hair covered head to toe with a brown and blonde mixture of color. With the setting sun putting an orange tint to it, I ended up freaking out as though I had seen death itself. I jumped to the ground, rolling as I hit it, getting up and booking it to the same meadow as my friend. Nick was waiting there already. As I'm running, I hear twigs and sticks breaking behind us. I knew this thing was chasing me. Once I got closer to the meadow, I saw Nick telling me to run. As I got to him, I looked back and saw the creature in the tree line. As we were staring at it, it was staring right back. It did something we will never forget. With us catching our breath, we heard it. It was like a loud roar. We ended up booking it to the front of the cabin, slamming the door shut, and my mom and her boyfriend looked at us puzzled. They were asking us questions and we tried to answer, but as I said, they thought we were crazy. After dinner and having some s'mores, we ended up going to bed. The cabin had an open area upstairs, where the six beds were for us kids to hang out in. Towards the back of the upstairs is a screen door. I woke up sometime in the middle of the night to a sound of scratching on wood. The light outside the screen never turns off. I saw a hand scraping the deck floor outside. I freaked out because I swear it was the same hand from that creature. The Not So Great Outdoors by Anonymous It was the fall of 2009 and at the time I was 16 years old. I lived in the central part of North Carolina. Nowadays the cities are loaded with things to do for the Halloween season, but back then, the best form of entertainment I could come up with was to visit the Devil's Tramping Grounds with a few friends. The Devil's Tramping Ground is a local legend. It sits right outside Siler City, North Carolina, about an hour away from where I live, and I have just gotten my license, so why not? For those of you unfamiliar with the locale or its legend, the Devil's Tramping Ground is a perfect, circular spot of dead soil in the middle of the woods, deep in the mountains. Despite the greenery around it, nothing grows in that circle. The legend says that if you drop or leave anything in that circle, it is moved and or disappears by morning, as the Devil supposedly comes here to plot his evil doings against humanity late at night, pacing in a circle as he thinks. That's the gist of it, basically. Siler City is a sticks and barns town with long, barren roads that seemingly translate to don't stop until you get the hell out of here. It was on one such road where I began to feel uneasy. Rural roads always have that heavy twilight zone energy, and the road we were on, conveniently titled Devil's Tramping Ground Road, was completely lacking streetlights. The only thing illuminating the overworked asphalt was the fading yellow headlights of my 2002 Mercury Cougar and the useless glow of a crescent moon. In those dim lights, we began to see splatter graffiti on the road leading up to the location. Creepy things I didn't expect, but never really would have understood the impact of until I saw them. In white paint, the road was decorated in crude warnings. The one that I remember the most was, The Devil Lives Here, and a huge white cross in front of the opening in the forest. I parked on the side of the road. The ground was immediately not as creepy as I expected. It wasn't too deep into the woods. In fact, the clearing could be made out from the road. Not as menacing as I had imagined. Maybe it was the empty beer cans or red Solo cups lying all around. Obviously people partied here. Or maybe it was the jokes my friends and I started making almost immediately that calmed my nerves. But it was 2 something in the morning. We decided to catch Lucifer right on his hour. 
and I remember feeling less on edge than I was on the road. My flashlight would get eaten through the trees if I moved it upwards, so I focused the beam on the soil. Truly, more interested in finding signs of the paranormal than my friends were. It was four of us total. Two of my friends went back to the car after a while. It was cold and there was not much to see. I stayed back with a buddy of mine. I brought a Ziploc with me, along with a pocket Bible, a rosary in my pocket just in case, and a stuffed rabbit that one of my best friends had given me. Before leaving, I scooped up some dirt and added it to the Ziploc. I found the prospect of dead soil so interesting and figured that maybe studying it under proper light compared to the other soil around will give me a better idea of what happened here. Alien radiation, climate change, sulfur, maybe the devil was just busy that night. In between jokes and complaining about the cold, we heard someone walking in the depth of the woods. This wasn't a mistaken sound. This wasn't a, I think someone is walking in the woods. This was a definite sound and a definite feeling. This was deep behind the brush between the trees, and these footsteps were heavy and unashamed of being heard. This is the first time I noticed no crickets were in these woods. There was no sound other than us. And these steps. I was even more unwilling to lift my little flashlight which was tucked under my armpit and pointed towards the soil sample. My eyes didn't need adjusting and so we stood there as I made out the shape of something in these woods. It was dark, but I could see it fairly well. It was tall, but not distinguishingly tall. It was human shaped, it stood on two feet, and it walked and walked and then suddenly it stopped. But then it would repeat itself by walking, and walking, and then abruptly stopping. I think this thing was slowly making its way towards us. We were petrified. Neither my friend nor I moved. I don't even think we breathed for a second. I was so overcome with fear that I felt numb, but a little tremble ran through my entire body. We just stared. Later we would discuss how we both wondered if this thing had seen us, and talk about how we didn't want to move in case it hadn't. At this future time, we would also discuss the smell. It was an awful putrid scent, like burning feces and rotting eggs and rotten meat. I grew up Catholic, hence the Bible and Rosary, and have always been told that that smell means the devil is around. That didn't help my case then. Even typing this now, I'm slightly trembling. The thing is that it stayed toying with us among the sticks in the forest. I say sticks because at the time, there was very little greenery. I was certain at this point that it saw me. I had that sixth sense feeling I was being stared right back at. And suddenly, I had an overwhelming fear, this unbearable despair. I realized then and there that my friend had been clutching the back collar of my shirt. I think I was so paralyzed with fear that I had ceased to feel anything but that numbness. I wasn't even cold anymore. But when I felt my friend's hand, I dropped everything in my arms and just hauled ass back to the car. Not necessarily running, but very hurried. I was sure my friend was behind me, but between us and in all honesty, I didn't even think about it at the time. I was just ready to go. I was so ready to go, in fact, that I missed the clear path completely and took off in between the trees and brush, heading towards the yellow glow of the headlights. It wasn't an incredibly long trek, like I said before. The road was right there, but it felt awful and long to me, and it was enough for those tiny branches to leave scrapes and even some cuts on my hands, cheeks, and neck. The whole ordeal couldn't have lasted too long. When I got back to my car, the keys were already in the ignition, and the other two friends were in there with the heat on. They both asked me what happened. The friend who stayed behind with me got in the passenger seat soon after and we took off. Our other friends, the ones who had been in the car, pointed out that our eyes were swollen and bright red. I think we had been crying, or at least it looked like we had been. I looked in the rearview mirror and my pupils were abnormally dilated. My eyelids were puffy and tender, and red. Keep in mind, this could all have some form of logical explanation. Maybe the fear made us cry without us knowing, and maybe the darkness combined with our nervous reaction enlarged our pupils. But it was still very odd. I realized long after that I left my Bible my stuffed rabbit, and my Ziploc bag in the dirt circle. I consider going back the next day in broad daylight, but I haven't been back there since. I still wonder and worry about who has my stuff.
Something is prowling my campsite. By Anonymous. First off, I want to thank you for telling the first story I submitted a few months back. You did a wonderful job, and I'm very grateful you decided to tell it. This next story takes place in the Cascade Mountains of Washington State. I had just came back from my second Iraq deployment, and had been assigned to the USA Air Ambulance Detachment at Fort Drum, New York. Seven months later, our unit was transferred to Yakima Training Center in Yakima, Washington. The constant deployment and change put a great deal of strain on an already weak marriage, resulting in her moving back to live with her folks in New Hampshire. I was depressed about it, and when a four-day weekend came up, I decided to head into the mountains for a little time for myself. The road was rough. Going as soon as I left the highway, I kept driving in my 2000 Ford F-150 until I saw another road about 10 miles away from the highway. This road was overgrown and looked like it hadn't been used for some time. Since my intention was to completely escape away from people for a few days, I took it. The road was hardly wide enough for my truck and went all the way and over a ridge into a quiet field in the middle of the woods. Small steam made its way through the center. I pulled off the road and decided to make a camp. Within a short period of time, a campfire was made and the back of my truck was set up for sleeping. I had an old camper shell and an inflatable mattress with blankets and such. I made a dinner of steak and potatoes and watched the sun disappear below the horizon. It was beautiful out there. No sounds of cars or anything. I felt like I honestly had the whole world to myself, and I felt good for the first time in a long time. A few drinks later of single malt scotch, I decided to go to bed and get some sleep for an early start the next day. I had planned to do some fishing and maybe have a small hike. The weather was cool and the stars and the moon were clear. I fell asleep as soon as my head hit the pillow. A few hours later though, I was woke up to a growl outside my truck. Heavy footsteps circled around my vehicle, and then I heard a high-pitched scream. I normally, at the sound of being paranoid, carry a handgun while camping, and this time was no different. I reached over and unholstered my Charter Arms Undercover 38 Special and sat with my back to the cab. It was still circling the vehicle, and I managed to glimpse it through the side camper window. A dark and mysterious looking woman and a short plump man were staring at my vehicle. They did not look armed, so I decided to go ask them what they wanted. I got out of the truck and looked in the direction I had seen them, but there was nothing. I searched the entire area around the site. Nothing. I got back in the truck and locked the door. It must have been my imagination, I told myself, and a few hours later, I eventually passed out again. I again awoke to the truck rocking and screaming and hollering in the early morning as a person was hitting my camper shell repeatedly and yelling obscenities. I did not want to remain there any longer. I slid through the sliding window in my cab, started the truck, and got the heck out of there. When my headlights came on, I saw a circle of people in robes surrounding me. I threw the truck into reverse and punched it out of there. They jumped out of the way as I barreled into reverse through their circle and took off like a bat out of hell, with them running behind me on foot. Then I got to the main road. I floored it out of there. Unfortunately, a highway patrolman was right there, and I was pulled over. He came to my window, and after I related the story of what happened, he told me that area I was in was home to a religious cult. The road I went up to was supposed to have a no trespassing sign, and a chain. I'm happy nothing more sinister happened. Do not camp in the Superstition Mountains by Anonymous. I'm a 17 year old guy currently living in Phoenix, Arizona. Around six months ago, this incident took place on an overnight trip into the Superstition Mountains, about an hour's drive east of Phoenix. I'm not going to specify the exact trail because I've been doing this a long time and I know enough what happens when you post things on the internet. Whether it's a golf course, abandoned mine, ghost, or whatever it may be, people usually come flocking with a lot of trash and loud music. Anyway, this trail I was taking was an 8 mile loop through a canyon, a simple in and out overnight trip. I planned to go with my friend, but the last minute cancellation on his part left me on my own. 
So, with a packed bag and a car ready to go, I decided to go independently. I was not leaving the house on time and having trouble navigating through forest roads. I didn't arrive at the trailhead until around 5.45. For those of you who don't backpack, this is a huge no-no. I had about a four-mile hike until I arrived at my planned camping spot, and it was getting dark fast, so I figured I would move quick. I could get at least two to three miles in before I had to find a spot to stop. This strategy left me hiking a very dark trail on my own with about 15 miles of dirt road between me and anyone else. Walking in the dark by itself can be scary, especially for where I was being on my own. Eventually, it got so dark that I could only see where my headlamp was pointing, and that's when I figured I needed to stop and set up a camp for the night. With only using the headlamp as my light source and trying to move fast, I ended up in a less than ideal spot. But there were some burnt pieces of wood in the remains of a fire circle. Hence, it looked like people had been there before, but not very recently. My priority was to get a fire going. I scanned the area and was able to find some dry wood, and I got the fire going. I got my tarp out, set it up, and cracked open a can of chili mac I had brought with me. I was looking forward to eating, as I was very tired. I felt good, my camp was set up, and my food was on the fire. The uneasiness that I had from the hike had almost gone away completely, and concern from the walk-in had virtually gone away. But it was still there, a side effect of camping alone in remote areas. To fully understand what happened, I must explain how my camp was set up. The site I had picked was a small clearing surrounded by large pine trees with the trail about 30 feet to my left. When you are in the woods and have a fire going, the fire cast a circle of light around it and everything on the edge of that circle. And past it, you're pitch black. I was sitting on the ground near my fire eating dinner when a small rock about the size of a marble was thrown into my camp. I looked at the tiny rock in shock as I was positive that I was the only person on this trail that night. I immediately turned my light on and towards the area where I would seen the rock come from, and due to the density of pines and brush I could only see about 10 feet. I spent the next 15 minutes in disbelief as I scanned the tree line that surrounded me, searching for whoever had thrown that rock, not daring to stray too far away from the fire that in hindsight offered me a false sense of security. After sitting back down and spending the rest of my time on high alert, I convinced myself that I had somehow kicked the rock or it had fallen from a tree. I went to sleep that night not expecting the pure terror that would unfold. I woke up to the sound of rustling leaves, barely inaudible if you weren't listening for them, but they were there. Still in a sleepy daze, I heard the rustling of leaves, harder to hear as I assumed they were moving away from me. I went to grab the handheld flashlight that I had next to me when I had fallen asleep, but the more I looked, the more scared I got as I realized that it was no longer there. I stood up in my sleeping bag, ducked out of my tarp, and looked around. I could see the light off in the woods. It couldn't have been more than 15 feet away. It was my flashlight lying on the ground in a pile of leaves. This is one of the few moments in my life where I have almost crapped my pants. The flashlight that I had left sitting right next to me when I had fallen asleep a few hours ago was now 15 feet away from me past the tree line in the woods. I hurriedly slipped on my boots, clutching my knife in my other hand and keeping my head on a swivel. I weighed out my options, staying here and waiting out the night or attempting the three mile hike back to my car in the dark. I figured that whoever or whatever was out here with me was going to have a better advantage if I was out on the trail without a light, so I decided to stay in the camp and wait it out. Eventually it came back. I could hear it walking through the woods. It was far off, but I could listen to it. It sounded like someone leisurely walking by, like they were on a stroll without a care in the world. Sometimes it would wander too far away and I would lose the sound of its steps but then an hour later, maybe two, it would return still faint as ever. This went on for three or four hours until I listened to the steps get closer and closer until they were easily seven feet away from me. The fire had been tiny as I had run out of wood in my pile. The footsteps stopped and everything went silent. I sat there for two hours clutching a knife in my hand, praying for two hours, taking the knife into my other hand and praying that I would hear nothing else. I stayed like that until the sun cast enough light to see that I was alone at my campsite. I packed my things up and speed walked the hell out of there. I did a record three mile hike. 
I arrived at the empty dirt road where my car was parked and nearly sprinted to it as I unlocked my Subaru, jumped in and drove, and didn't stop until I was at least 20 miles away. I had stopped at a gas station in Apache Junction to buy a Red Bull, mostly just to see and talk to another human being. As I exited the store, I read what was written in the dust on the back of my window. It said, Sleep well? Many things have happened to me on my various adventures, especially through Arizona. But this was the most mysterious and scariest day by far, so I thought I'd share it. There is a seriously deranged person living in the Superstition Mountains. Do yourself a favor and stay far away from there. Ghost Stories Turn Out to Be All Too Real by Anonymous In 2009, I was interested in the paranormal, since I had many paranormal experiences growing up. I found a website that held ghost tours at the old Southwestern General Hospital. I was excited and ready to go on a ghost hunt. The group that held the ghost tour was named Ghost, or Ghost Hunters of South Texas. The group was professional, and they used many of the items that paranormal researchers used at the time. Before the tour, they showed us proof that they have captured in previous investigations while investigating the property. EVPs included a little boy saying, play with me please, and a woman with a southern accent responding to questions. The woman is said to be in an old time dress, and sometimes old time nurse attire. After the tour, the group said they were having openings for new members, and the new members would be tested and would be considered and maybe being part of the new team. I was quick to join and try out. I made the team. The team would have private group ghost hunts, so we would have the building to ourselves. The third floor was used as a hospice type of area. The building has four floors. The first, second, and fourth floor were left abandoned, and they look like a scene out of a horror movie. Hospital beds lay in rooms dusty and unused. Many had dates from 1995 and before. I even found a death log that had many names and dates. The most active areas were the fourth and second floor. The fourth floor had a baby nursery, and many rooms that were once used for families that would be welcoming new babies. One EVP that was caught in that area was one of crying babies. At the time the EVP was caught, there were no babies in the building, and it was after midnight sometime when it was caught. Also on the fourth floor, there was a long hallway with empty patient rooms. In that hallway, shadows were always seen running or moving. The second floor was an old area. Also, many shadow figures were seen in this area. When doing research on the deaths in the building, I came up with what looked like to be a nurse who was crushed to death when a malfunction with the elevator happened years ago. During the time I was a part of this group, we investigated this building tons of times. I might even care to say maybe over a hundred. I also led ghost tours in the building with other members. I witnessed shadows, disembodied voices, screams, and one time heard a female humming a song only to find the room empty and dark. I've seen videos of doors opening on their own with no wind or people in the building. Also, the third floor had employees that would see things and hear things very often. Patients also complained of a kid running in their room or a man standing over their bed just looking at them, only to disappear. Over the years, I gained experience and loved what I did. As a group, we investigated many places such as schools, homes, and cemeteries in El Paso. We also got to investigate the old Asarco smelter before it was demolished several years later. I got to ghost hunt with people from Ghost Hunters and Ghost Hunters International. I met many celebrities and the group had them take their own personal ghost tours. It was fun and I grew a thick skin for fearing anything that goes bump in the dark. One of my favorite places to investigate was Southwestern General Hospital. I never believed in being followed home. One night after investigating, I was at my apartment eating on my couch and watching TV. I had my hallway light on near the front door that was visible from where I was sitting. Suddenly, from the corner of my eye, I saw a shadow of a person on the wall near the door. I turned and saw the shadow in full form. 
It was about six foot tall and completely black. Then, not even a second later, the shadow moved as if it was running down my hallway to my bedroom. I froze in horror, thinking somebody was in my apartment. I got up and walked to my bedroom. Nobody was there. I searched the whole house up and down, and then I thought to myself, maybe I'm just going crazy. I soon went to bed a few minutes later. It was probably about 3.20 a.m. when I felt my bed shaking. I woke up to my sheets being pulled off me very slowly and deliberately. I tried to move, but I just could not. My sheet slid very slowly off me towards the floor. I could not move, and I started to hear growling in my right ear. From the corner of my eye, I could see something moving near my head on the right of me. It was on my pillow. I could only see it from the peripheral vision that it had hair. It was hairy and brown. If I could compare it to something, I would say Chewbacca from Star Wars type hair. It was moving, very slowly, but obviously very deliberately. It was growling as well. My eyes started to water up with tears. I tried to move my arm, but I just couldn't. I could only move my fingers. The blanket was still being pulled off me little by little until it hit the floor and I was no longer covered by my sheet. I felt the hairy thing moving right next to me and the growling grew louder. Then suddenly, I was able to sit up and I turned and looked to see what was there next to me. The hairy thing was gone but I could see the imprint of where it had sat right next to me just a moment ago. It was the size of a full-grown cat. Then I looked around the room to gather my sanity. I don't own a cat. My sheet was on the floor, and my eyes were still watery. I asked myself, maybe it was just sleep paralysis. I found it hard to sleep that night, since I lived alone in that apartment. The next day I had a girl over to my apartment. I was seeing her from school. I was playing PlayStation and she asked if she could take a nap in my bed. I said, of course. She went to my bed and fell asleep. Around 20 minutes later, she suddenly came back to my living room in tears. She said, uh, I have to leave now. I asked her what was happening and what was wrong. What she said shocked me. She said that something shook the bed and woke her up. She could not move and then something was growling and started getting close to her ear. Then the bed went down as if somebody lied down next to her. She tried to scream for me and could not. Then she felt as if somebody was breathing on her neck as the growling grew louder. She said it lasted about two minutes and then she was finally able to move. Once she was able to move, she ran to me in the living room. After she explained this, I grabbed her stuff and helped her leave. I did not tell her what happened to me the night before, but I had that same exact experience. And what happened to her was enough proof that something was not right. I could not explain what was happening. First thing that came to mind that something probably followed me home from the hospital. After a few days, all the activity suddenly stopped. Only when I would go in on investigations, I would see shadows in my apartment, and then they would just go away. I loved what I did, and the only time I feared the paranormal was this moment. I no longer ghost hunt, and the group no longer gets together. Southwest General Hospital was purchased and is now remodeled and is in use. I can only imagine what the employees of the LTAC go through by being in that building. Every now and then I drive down Cotton and pass the building. I miss the days of being part of Ghost El Paso. If you are ever in El Paso after stopping by at Chico's Tacos, be sure to pass by the old building by the Star on the Mountain formerly known as Southwest General Hospital. I Never Believed by Anonymous I would like to start by saying that while I am interested in the paranormal, I tend to be skeptical and prefer to think things out rationally before dismissing every little thing as a ghost or the like. This experience, however, has no logical explanation I can think of. I am new here, and as well, I apologize in advance if I'm not doing this correctly. So, let's get into this. I was 17 and it was mid-October, nearing Halloween. My family had gone to a small, rural town to meet up with some good friends. We were going to get dinner and catch up for old times' sake as my siblings and I had grown up with the children of the other families. After dinner, the parents stayed at the bar drinking, and those of us who were not of legal drinking age were starting to get a little bored. That is when one of my friends brought up the local cemetery. 
Apparently, there is a cemetery in this town that is said to be haunted. I'm pretty positive that some ghost hunter paranormal type show did an episode about it or something, but the legends are said to have been around since before that. The story goes that a group of teenage boys were wandering into the graveyard one Halloween night with the intention of causing trouble and maybe stirring up some spooky ghost action in celebration of Halloween. After messing around for a while with no unexplained phenomena, they decided to sit in on top of the mausoleum, which is basically just a big tomb built up around a coffin instead of burying it in the ground. They were about to call it quits and head home when suddenly, unseen hands seemed to push one of the boys off the top of the tomb and into the ground. All the boys were obviously scared and hightailed it out of there, all of them feeling an eerie, ominous energy following them around for weeks after the incident. There have also been numerous reports of orbs, headstones inexplicably moving or disappearing altogether, ghostly apparitions, inscriptions being changed, flashes of light, strange noises, the whole works. I, of course, was more than excited to check it out. We arrived at the cemetery well after dark, and one of my girlfriends, we will call her Emma, and I were the only two brave ones enough to go in. We hopped right out of the car, careful to be as inconspicuous as we could since we did not want the police showing up and ruining our ghost hunting experience. We headed toward the entrance. It was chilly and a bit windy, as autumn in Wisconsin tends to be. We gripped each other's hands and started down the gravel path. As soon as we passed the fence that surrounded the plot of land, everything seemed to get very still and very quiet. We could not even hear the wind anymore which was strange as it had been breezy as we got out of the car. It was so silent that even whispering in our steps in the gravel seemed, pun absolutely not intended, loud enough to wake the dead. Though there were no lights in or near the cemetery, there was enough moonlight filtering through the clouds to allow us to see well. We soon realized we had no idea where the fabled haunted mausoleum was, but kept walking anyway. We made a random left turn, and lo and behold, there it was, about 30 yards or so in front of us. Surprisingly, we had great luck, right? Uh, I don't think so. As we approached, I began to feel almost an electric sort of energy in my fingers and hands, but I wrote this off as just nerves or something due to breaking the law. We reached the tomb, and this thing is absolutely huge. It was easily twice my height, at the very least and made of weathered gray stone with moss and lichen growing sparsely on it. We stare at it for a moment and Emma whispers, You should touch it. Being the big bad ghost hunter I am, I oblige. There is really nothing remarkable about the cool roughness of the stone, so I decide to take it a step further and hop up to sit up on the lip of the curved top of the thing. Again, nothing happens, so I jokingly whisper shout, If there's anyone here, any spirits or anything, come on out. After listening in silence for a second or two, I think, F it, and make my way to the very top where the kid is rumored to have been pushed off by ghostly hands. I have Emma snap a photo or two of me before climbing back down. Slightly disappointed by the lack of spooky encounters, we agree to head out and are about to do just that when we see a pair of headlights slowly creeping down the road that borders one side of the graveyard. We immediately assumed someone noticed us and called the cops, so we crouched down behind some bushes with the mausoleum directly to our left. Both of us are completely silent except for our breathing as we watch the vehicle slowly make its way down the street. I am watching its taillights turn the corner when I hear a low, creepy, menacing laugh coming from right behind me. It sounded so strange, like it was a few feet away but also right in my ear at the same time. I'm freaked out, and I'm about to chalk it up to adrenaline-induced hallucination, when Emma, who is standing to my left, whispers, Hey, did you hear that? My blood ran cold, as I slowly nod a silent, Yes, I did. I cautiously turn my head to one direction, and try to see if I can hear it. I kid you not. I didn't hear anything, but what I did see was a dark figure stand up from behind one of the headstones not ten feet away from us. I scream bloody murder and somehow end up on the ground as the next thing I know Emma is pulling at my arm shouting, 
We have to run. We need to get out of here. Come on. I let her pull me to my feet and lead me blindly by the hand. We are full out sprinting, tripping over gravestones and plants and who knows what else in the dark. We cannot even find the exit in our panic. We finally reach a gap in the fence and I can feel the tears streaming down my face as I run for my life down the middle of the road, not even paying attention to the oncoming headlights until I nearly run into them. Luckily, it was the car containing the rest of our friends, and we rip the door open and throw ourselves inside screaming, Go! Go! Please just drive! Before we even bothered to sit in an actual seat or shut the door. I cannot for the life of me remember who was driving, but I think our panic and terror shook them enough that they did exactly what we asked of them and sped away back to the bar. They kept asking us what happened and if we were okay, but we would not calm down enough to answer them until we were back inside the bar and sat down. Still shaking and out of breath, we recounted our story to all of them, drunk parents included. I think a lot of them were skeptical, and honestly, I would have been too if I had not experienced it myself. In the weeks that followed, I felt the same eerie energy the boys in the legend describe hanging over my head. Personally, I attribute it more to paranoia after being scared out of my mind by something I could not actually see, but it made me feel uneasy nonetheless. It has been a few years since this happened and I still cannot think of a single, logical explanation for what actually happened that night. While I have no idea how credible anyone else's reported experiences on this show are, I know we were without a doubt the only people in that graveyard, or even on the streets for that matter, and we would have heard someone trying to sneak up on us. The sound of that laugh was so unnatural. I cannot get it out of my head. Even now, I have never been more scared than I was that night. And I now know what people mean when they talk about not being able to fully believe in the paranormal until you have experienced it firsthand. Anyway, I just thought I would share this experience with you. I hope you enjoyed it. Encounter with a Potential Serial Killer by Stormlark83 This happened around 2002 when I worked swing shifts at Hewlett Packard as a life test technician. We would run their newest printers through various tests, using different media types in specific environments, such as high humidity, low humidity, high concentrations of dust and sand, etc. Then write up reports if there were any defects. I lived in a large apartment complex with my stepsister as a roommate. She worked at a bar downtown, and although we ended our shifts around the same time every night, she often hung out for about an hour after clocking out. She had a lot of friends, and they stopped by quite often. It was common to hear someone knocking at 2 or 3 a.m. That's why I didn't think much of it when I heard someone at the door one night after coming home from work. I checked the peephole, but didn't recognize the guy. He looked a bit older than my stepsister's usual friends probably in his late 30s or even early 40s. We were in our early 20s at the time, but I assumed he was her friend and opened the door. Now, I'd like to take some time to explain my behavior before telling the rest of the story. Unfortunately, I was a victim of SA for many years when I was younger. The reason I'm bringing this up now is there's something strange that can happen to me in certain situations. It's almost like an involuntary freeze or submission response. I'm unsure if anyone would understand it, if they haven't experienced it themselves, but I'll try to describe it the best uh, as I can. It happens in levels or stages. At stage one, I became more, you know, submissive. I keep my eyes and head down, uh, I answer in short phrases, I'm still aware of what's happening, but things become dulled, and speaking in complete sentences becomes difficult, like wading through molasses. If things progress, I become increasingly more detached from my surroundings, leading to a near catatonic state at its peak. At this point, I was utterly incapable of speech or movement. I'm basically in shock. So, back to the story, I guess. I opened the door and let the man know my stepsister wasn't home yet, but they would be here soon. He surprised me when he said he didn't know her and would come to see me. I asked if we knew each other from somewhere, and he said no. He said he often saw me walking to my car holding a guitar case and wanted to know if I could play. The guy seemed, uh, off to say the least. 
There was something about him, his, his facial expressions, posture, and the way he just looked at me. Alarms were going off in my head. My gut told me this person was bad news and I was in danger. Unfortunately, my stupid brain entered stage one instead of slamming and locking the door. I looked down and said, yeah, sure. He wanted to play my guitar, and he wanted to ask if he could come inside, and for some reason I said okay. I stepped aside and let him in. He closed the door behind him and I heard him lock it. He asked where my guitar was. I said my bedroom. He asked which room was mine and I somehow managed to wrestle a tiny amount of strength to tell him to wait on the couch. Something about him taking me to my bedroom was just too much. Even though I was pretty sure that terrible things were about to happen to me at this point, he obliged and made himself comfortable in the living room while I fetched my guitar. Many of you probably are wondering why I didn't use that moment to save myself. I had a cell phone. I could have tried calling the police. Then again, the man hadn't really done anything wrong, and I did let him inside, so what would I have told them even if I managed to snap out of it enough to try? So I did exactly as I was told, I brought my guitar to him. He asked me how long I had been playing, and I just said a few years. He asked me to play something, and I apologized because I mostly only knew religious music from playing in a church band. He said that was fine. I played a few songs, and then he started crying. So I stopped and sat there for a bit. He apologized for getting so emotional and said it was because I had the voice of an angel. He then asked if he could play something for me and I said sure. I handed him the guitar. He acted like it was out of tune and started rambling while messing with the knobs. A bunch of crazy stuff about how he used to be the lead guitarist for Metallica and how they kicked him out of the band and stole all his songs. I just nodded like I believed him and was sympathetic. He tried a chord or two but it was apparent he didn't even know how to play. I mean, he really didn't even know how to tune the damn thing. He said he was used to playing... He said something about not being used to playing acoustic and would need one of his electric guitars to play for me. He said I should go back with him to his apartment. <laughs> I said, okay, many of you are probably thinking, what the heck is wrong with you, bro? If it makes you feel any better, I thought the same thing. Unfortunately, my body wasn't listening to me and instead, I was following this guy outside. Things became very fuzzy as my mental state started to decline rapidly. I could not tell you for the life of me where we went. It was another apartment somewhere in the complex, but I, I don't know where. When we went inside, there was almost nothing there, just a TV on the floor and two milk crates with pillows for chairs. No boxes, no furniture. It was like nobody even lived there. It felt like a freaking crack house where people were squatting. He smacked his forehead and said, Oh darn, I forgot I sold all my guitars last week. It was a lie, but I nodded and said, That's okay. He asked if I wanted anything to drink, and I said no. He grabbed a beer from the fridge, took me by the arm, and led me in front of the TV. He said he had a bootleg copy of the latest Star Wars film, Attack of the Clones, and asked if I wanted to watch it. And for whatever reason, I said okay. He sat me down on the floor held me to his chest, and started rocking us back and forth while rubbing my back and talking. The physical contact worsened my mental state considerably. I could barely follow his words, but it wasn't good. They spoke of a shadow that haunted him at night. He said so much weird stuff about demons and angels. I wasn't surprised when he admitted that he was planning to kill me. The shadow had told him to. He said he'd been watching me for over a week when I got home. He had been waiting for me tonight. I nodded as he said these things like routine, and we weren't discussing him literally m planning my impending murder here, but I don't know what was going on. He started crying again while talking, and he held me tighter. He said he didn't want to do it anymore. He said he was pretty sure I was an angel, which must be why the shadow targeted me. I just kept nodding like, a, like some sort of idiot. Eventually, he decided to not kill me but said he wasn't sure how he could keep the darkness at bay. He told me to go home before he changed his mind. I said, okay, and managed to stand up and walk towards the door. Suddenly he grabs me from behind in a bear hug. I froze, expecting the worst, but he reached for my hand, forced it open, and pressed something into my palm. He said it was an ancient coin that had been in his family for generations and was probably worth a million dollars. He wanted me to have it to remember him by. He asked me to promise not to sell it, 
I said of course I wouldn't, and he let me go. I walked out the door and wandered outside in a daze. It took me quite some time to find my way home. The coin turned out to be a silver dollar from 1978. I still have it, and the worst part is, that thing still bothers me. I was embarrassed by how I reacted and let this basically happen to me. I never really told anybody about it. My stepsister has been interested in moving for a while, and I found us a new place, so maybe we'll be safer there. But, I don't know. This could have been a harmless, weird guy doing weird guy stuff. But, who knows? I couldn't tell you. Beaver the Creeper by Kiwi This was the first time I had ever really been away from home. I finally moved into a new school and was excited to explore the campus and find ways to connect with my fellow students. I heard through the grapevine that a local theater company was looking for extras to help with their upcoming products and that some of my classmates were trying out. Growing up, I had always been a theater nerd, so this would be an excellent way to become part of the theater club in my new community and make some new friends. Something important to note here is that the show was in a city-maintained forest near the school and the audience members would travel throughout the woods to get from scene to scene. So I get to auditions, everything goes well, and I make it into the show with three other girls from my school. The four of us would serve as guides to help the audience reach the scenes scattered throughout the forest. While I didn't know any of them personally, two girls were in some of my classes, and the other girl said she was a year below us. We became inseparable over time, as four young women who were going to be wandering around the forest by themselves in the dark, this show did take place at night by the way, we wanted to ensure that we had each other's back at all times. Girl code, you know? So, fast forward a few weeks, we eventually mastered the routes we'd be taking, and everything seemed to be going pretty smoothly except for the caretaker. For the sake of privacy, we're going to call him Beaver. Beaver was your classic grumpy old caretaker. He constantly complained about the noise we were making, grumbled about the tech stuff we needed to use, and was an overall just unpleasant guy. This would have been fine on its own, but Beaver also had a nasty habit for making inappropriate conversations with some actors. For example, he would make jokes about having cameras in the bathrooms, telling people to change costumes and use the restroom in the forest instead. Beaver even said something incredibly sexual to one of the actors, and while I won't go into detail, I will say it made him highly uncomfortable. It was bizarre, mainly because the show was getting a bit raunchy toward the end, and Beaver would get extremely upset that something like that was being shown in a place where regular patrons could see. From what I could remember, he sometimes became pretty aggressive, often screaming at the director and making threats. Despite all this, the show went on. When it was time to open the front to the public, the three girls from my school and I were stationed around the entrance to help the audience get settled in and ready for the show. I was supposed to be greeting them in character and verify that they had brought or bought any tickets. Everything went very well and the first couple of shows went on without much incident. However, things took a massive turn on the second or third to last show. It was a few minutes before audience members were supposed to start trickling in. So I made my way to the table to prepare the guest list. My station was a fair bit away from all the other actors. The only other person who could see me was the girl a year younger than me. Beaver decided to make his way over to my table and stood right in front of me. He started asking me some strange questions, but I shrugged it off, thinking he was just playing along with the show. So I made some silly banter with him in character. Eventually he said, Hey, come over here. I want to show you something. I raised my eyebrow and glanced at the girl to ensure she was watching. She was watching our every move and I knew the other actors were ahead. So I carefully made my way around the table and stood about five to six feet away from them. Beaver suddenly grabbed me saying, Ah, you can't see it there, come over here. He pulled me beside him and pointed to the sky, mumbling about the stars. I was frozen for a spell until I noticed he was slowly pulling me away from everyone else. I snapped out of it and wrenched my arm from his grasp, saying something about how I had to return to work. He looked like he was about to retaliate, but walked away when he saw the girl watching our conversation. 
I returned to my table, exchanging a shaking glance with the girl before returning to work. The show goes on and everything seems okay when the director calls for all the cast members to remain in a particular area after the show because there had been an incident. Beaver had found two young girls who made it into the show, screamed at them because they weren't old enough to see a performance of this kind. He dragged them in front of the audience, marched them off somewhere away from their direction, and now people were calling the authorities because they had no idea where they were. The cops did find the girls who were crying and severely shaken up and were probably just taken away to get home safely. When we heard this, the girl and I looked at each other in shock as realization hit. While we don't think he did anything illegal, he handled the situation far from appropriate and confined him to his house for the remainder of the shows. The rest of the shows went on just fine and I'm still very close friends with some of the actors. But part of me still wonders what Beaver might have done if that girl might not have been watching us that night. The Man With No Thumb by Winter Warlock I've only ever shared my paranormal experiences with a very select few friends in real life, but I have quite a few good ones. I would kind of like to tell them for people to discuss and enjoy. This first one is my very first experience ever, and I was too young to really appreciate it in its full gravity. I'll warn you now, it starts off very sad, but the ending will be worth it. Some of this is my memory and some of this is filled in by my mother because I was kind of young. When we were very young, my older brother got cancer, lymphoma. He was six at the time and I was three. Even so, I do have a few scattered memories of him and we were inseparable. The doctors and my parents tried everything they could, but his young body could not handle the aggressive treatment required to cure him. He passed away at just six. My father dove deep into alcoholism to cope, and my mother became super busy trying to support the family, paying the medical bills, and planning her son's funeral. Without my brother to play with, I would seclude myself in our room upstairs, sitting alone, playing with my toys. I do distinctly remember a very comforting old man coming to play with me sometimes. He would dress like an old farmer, leather boots and all, but he didn't have a thumb on his right hand. I didn't think anything of it because the old man seemed really nice. My mother heard me talking while I was playing upstairs and just assumed I was goofing around. When I came downstairs, she would always ask who I was talking to. I would always say, the man with no thumb. She let it go at the time, but thought it was strange that I made up an imaginary friend that didn't have a thumb. Fast forward a few weeks and I'm upstairs playing with the man. My grandma had come by to check on us after everything that the family had been through. She asked my mom who I was talking to upstairs. The man with no thumb, according to him. My grandma turned white and called me downstairs. She asked me to describe the man, and I described him in great detail. His face, his clothes, everything right down to the missing right thumb. My grandma knew from the description that I should probably tell my grandpa. So I described the man to my grandpa and he was speechless. I described his father. His face, his demeanor, and the thumb he lost in a farming accident on the family farm. The family farm was sold before I was even born, and I didn't even know that my family had that type of background. My great-grandfather also died far before I was ever born, and she never knew what he looked like, hence why she didn't catch on at first. I didn't see him much after that, but my whole life growing up, I do remember occasionally hearing heavy boots walking around the house. It's always a comfort to know he's still checking up on me. Man in the Wardrobe by Josh C. I was around five years old. My bedroom was the smallest room in the house, which I had a single bed and a wardrobe that used to belong to my older brother who had since left home to join the army. One night I was watching TV laying in my bed, and I suddenly had this overwhelming feeling that someone was watching me. So I looked over my left shoulder to my door and there was no one there. As I looked back at the TV, I thought to myself, I just saw something in the wardrobe. I looked back at the wardrobe, but it was closed, so I shrugged it off and carried on watching TV until I eventually fell asleep. That night, I had a nightmare about a weird figure standing in my wardrobe, and I woke up sweating and crying, so I ran to my parents' room and told them I felt sick. When I was that age, if I was ill, I would be able to sleep downstairs with my mom. 
so I used this as an excuse to not sleep in my room that night. The next night, again, I was watching TV in my room, and by the time the video I was watching had finished, it was dark outside, and I didn't have a light on, so the room went completely dark, except for two white lights coming from the gap between the wardrobe doors. Terrified. I ran to my parents again, and said I felt sick, so I spent the night downstairs again. After a few nights of nothing happening, I almost forgot about what had happened entirely, so I fell asleep quite quickly, but this scratching noise woke me up. All that was lighting my room at this point was the night light from the moon coming into my window. The scratching was clearly coming from the wardrobe, but I thought maybe it was just my sister in the next room or something, but I stayed sitting up in my bed staring at this wardrobe. After what felt like hours, but was probably only just 30 seconds, I started to turn away and the doors creaked open. I quickly turned on my TV, which showed static. This pretty much lit up the entire room as it was so small. I looked straight into the wardrobe and I could clearly see this figure. A silhouette of a tall man in a long black coat, black hair, no face, and bright white eyes staring down at me. I stayed downstairs for a week after that. As strange as it sounds, I got used to this figure in my wardrobe. There was clearly no room in there for someone to squeeze into the wardrobe, but somehow there would always be this massive figure inside. I would hear scratching sounds and bumping sounds, but I would never see it leave the wardrobe. About a year later, my brother was discharged from the army, training on medical grounds, and had ended up moving back in with us. I was now in the room next to my old room, and he had that one. One day, I told him about the wardrobe, which was still in here, which was still in there, and he had told me he had experienced the exact same thing when he was my age. Scary Tijuana Story by Scienter18 This happened in 2000 or 2001. I had just moved to SoCal for college. My roommate and I, both males in our early 20s, thought it would be fun to drive into Mexico because it was not far away, maybe just a couple of hours at most by car, and we had never been. One Saturday late morning, we had made the drive into Tijuana parked and immediately hit a bar slash restaurant. It was around 1 or 2 p.m. We ate tacos and drank a lot of beer and tequila. We got pretty faded as this place was called Senior Frogs or something like that. I think we had cigars too. After a couple of hours, we exited onto the street pretty drunken and in very good spirits. It was still daylight, maybe mid-afternoon. I think our plan was to hang out a while longer than drive back home at dusk once we sobered up a bit. We were approached on the street by a very friendly Hispanic male. He was very short, maybe 5'2", Joe Pesci style, approximately 30s in age, and stocky. He was literally dressed like Louie from Revenge of the Nerds. He may have also had glasses on. He was very friendly and presented himself as like a tour guide. Hey, you guys not from around here? Let me show you guys the local spots. It's that kind of presentation. My first impression was very friendly and we disregarded him and said no thank you. At first, I, I didn't really notice anything to be scared of. He was dressed like a stereotypical nerd and I guess he did have some pretty hardcore tattoos on his neck. Still, I was not scared of him. Just didn't want to pay for this service. We kept walking and were in a busy part of town with a lot of people, so we really were not concerned about him at all. But he kept on just following us around, trying to make chit chat about what bars or clubs were the best. It just seemed like he was a promoter or something. We were kind of aimlessly walking and he began to recommend different strip joints which we also disregarded. Slowly it seemed we were walking more and more into the outskirts of town unknowingly. I don't know how this happened but he was already right there following us the entire time. I don't recall how but he was finally able to get us interested in a particular strip joint. He pointed it out and said it was probably the best or something. Maybe just because he was relentless, we agreed to walk over and go in. Oddly, we couldn't get in as my roommate didn't have his ID on him when we had just been drinking without issues. We ultimately walked away from this place and the follower began to ask if we had any interest in drugs and he rattled off the name of a few. This was the first time he had mentioned drugs. Like an idiot, I said I was interested in a drug he had mentioned. He said follow me and then led us toward a nearby bar, which was now really on the outskirts of town. On the walk over, my roommate quietly asked me what the hell I was doing buying drugs from this guy, but we continued. I told him it was fine. We walked into this crappy two-story bar and he told my roommate to wait at the bar. He and I walked into the bathroom. I recall walking into a bathroom stall with him and him asking how much drugs I wanted. 
I said $20 worth, which was all the money I had on me. I gave him the $20 and the bathroom door opened shortly thereafter. Some random guy came in and gave the tour guide a small bag of drugs. He then gave them to me. I looked at it quickly and it seemed legit. I put it into my pocket. Well, I guess it's time to get out of here, right? Well, this guy is kind of in my way. So I make a move to pass him and say thank you. And he said something like, Hold on a second. What about that $20 you owe me? I said I already gave it to you. And he reached into his pocket, I remember this clear as day, and pulled out a pathetic crumpled up $1 bill and said, Nah, you just gave me a dollar. I literally was crapping my pants at this point. I told him I didn't have any more money, which was true. The bathroom door opened and my roommate walked in and began to use the urinal on the other side from us. I felt relief he was nearby. The tour guide was telling me something about, Does your friend have money? I told him I didn't know and the tour guide suggested that we go to the ATM. I agreed and told my roommate to follow us. We were now back on the street in daylight following him to an ATM. My roommate didn't understand what was going on. I was whispering to him to give me $20, but he was saying he didn't have it. He may have suspected something weird was going on. We were getting back into a part of town with more people on the streets, which was comforting. I kept asking my roommate to just give me $20 so I can get this guy off our back. He finally gave me 20. Just as we were nearing an ATM, I turned confidently to our tour guide, partly because we were now on the street with more people around, and gave him the $20 with the remark, here's your $20, now screw off. He immediately grabbed the $20 and shoved it into his pocket. He demanded more money. We began walking away from him in another direction, but towards a populated shopping area. He stuck right behind us and was saying scary things that I can't quite remember. He seized my right wrist there, I had a watch on there that cost about 150 bucks. I wrenched my arm away, and we kept walking at a brisk pace. Now, a lot of people were around, and I quickly took the watch off and put it in my cargo shorts pocket. I passed by a market and two Hispanic males exited in front of us as we passed them. The tour guide yelled something at them and spoke to them briefly, and then all three of them were suddenly running at us. The cholo spinned me around and tried to pin me onto the side of the wall. The tour guide approached and put a big ballpoint pen to my neck. It hurt. One of the other guys began looking for the watch and I stopped him and simply retrieved it to give it to him. Once this happened, they fought for it and my roommate and I ran away. I looked back over my shoulder and they were literally fighting each other for this watch. A metal swatch watch. It was nothing. We got to our car, tossed the drugs, and drove back across the border safely. I have only been back to Mexico one other time, in Rosarito Beach, and that time was also messed up by a lot of people that are similar to this. Chasing in a Maze by Otherwise Add 1747 a few years ago, I entered the University of Lausanne to enter my medical studies. I had just arrived in the city and even in the country. I was very excited to start my year, to discover the university, to meet new people, etc. Everything was going great until the end of the third week. Friday, sometime around 9 p.m., I leave the library. I say goodbye to my friends and start to go home. The pace of work was already very intense, so we had been working all day, and I was in a rush to get home. It was my favorite part of the day because I got to put on my music, take the subway, and then the train. It gives me a chance to rest and catch up with my thoughts. Anyway, that night it was so cold, there was no one left outside. It takes me about seven minutes to walk from the library to the subway. I'm walking quietly with my music in my ears when suddenly I get a shiver that runs down my body from head to toe. I start to feel comfortable as if someone was watching me. And at that point, I pause my music and decide to not turn around to check in case the person is trying to be inconspicuous and if I notice them, I was fearful that something might happen. I don't want to run either because I'm not sure if I can run faster and I don't know exactly where to go. At this point, we pass a glass building so I decide to look inside and pretend I'm fixing my hair. I quickly glance in the corner of my eye and my blood runs cold. There is someone walking a few feet behind me in a hoodie. I try to reassure myself that he was just finishing work and going home, and that he is cold and that is why he is wearing his hoodie, and there are no houses for civilians for quite some time. I decide to send a message to my mother saying, Come and get me in front of the insert name of the building, please. I really don't feel safe. 
It is important to know that the university is 30 minutes away by car from my house. At this point, I don't find another solution and I decide to take refuge in a building while waiting for my mother to come and get me. As I was about to go back, I opened the door, took off my helmet, and went down the stairs to find a hiding place. We entered by the third floor. I thought I was out of trouble when suddenly I hear the door I came through open. This time I am sure he is after me, but since I'm new, I don't know this building and where it leads. I run downstairs at full speed and I hear him behind me. I can hear this guy's footsteps running down the stairs at full speed as well. I run without looking back, being sure that he is running faster than I can, and that he will catch up with me. I don't even know where I'm going, but I pray that I don't fall into a dead end. Looking back, I even think that it was like that scene in The Shining with the labyrinth. I don't know how far ahead of him I was, so I opened a window in the hallway to make it look like I was out of there, and opened a little door further. It was a huge auditorium, and it was pitch dark. I went down the stairs and hid under a desk. I put my phone on silent and did my best to hide. My mom had been texting me a lot asking me what was going on and saying she was on her way with my dad. I texted her I'm in insert name of building. He is looking for me, please come quickly. I hid under the desk thinking I was screwed. My hiding place sucked and he was going to find me any second. Then I heard a thud and a huge scream and I don't think I've ever been so scared in my life when I heard that scream. For 15 minutes, my mother was sending me messages telling me to hang on. And at the end of those 15 long minutes, waiting for him to find me, I finally got the message from my mom saying that she's here, and she has the police. They are going to enter the building and they need to know where I am. I just tell them I'm on the second floor because I had no idea where I was, and after two minutes, I heard the door of the auditorium open and it was the police coming after me. Once I got out, they took my statement and they said they would check out the university management. The next day, they contacted us and said that they saw on the surveillance cameras that there was indeed someone who had followed me. Apparently, there were no cameras inside that particular building, though. You can't see the guy's face and therefore, we don't know who it is. They just sadly said that the security was going to do patrols at night and advised me to do something... They just said that security was going to do patrols at night and advised me to have someone with me when I'm out. Battlefield Horror Story by Brandon D. Hello all, for some context, I'm a 19-year-old male and this story takes place on a national battlefield, Prairie Grove Park in northern Arkansas to be specific, right in the Ozark Mountain. Now, to begin the actual story. On an early December weekend, I and hundreds of others would participate in a reenactment on Prairie Grove, Arkansas. My friends and a group of other people that were all around my age always tried to have fun on these weekends, either going to a dance, drinking, or just walking around during scheduled times. It is a lot of fun. The weekend started as usual. Friday, everyone showed up and I met with all my buddies. After we all got dressed and formed up a... After we all got dressed and formed up into a battalion, we marched off to our camps. Nothing eventful happened Friday night as many of us were tired from driving many miles. We slept in big tents. Friday night to keep warm from the icy winds. Saturday started typically as well. We did a battle for the spectators, chilled around camp, and enjoyed ourselves. Come Saturday night though, my life would be on the verge of death. After the battle, they sent my battalion into picket, which all that is is taking post and watching for the enemy. When it was my company's turn for picket duty, it was around 1 a.m., and they usually lasted about an hour and a half. My partner and I were stationed on the furthest end of the line of pickets, and our left side was unprotected. Around 30 minutes in, we heard footsteps to the left of us. We gathered our rifles and kept alert for any enemy pickets. After 15 or so minutes, and not hearing anything else, we let our guards down and rested. I lighted my pipe and began to enjoy myself, and then suddenly, we heard a scream come from behind us. Then, one from in front of us. Something was running through the tall grass we were guarding. We could barely see anything but could see a massive dog-looking shadow illuminated by the moonlight. We called to the other pickets to fall back to our officer, but before I could start returning, a huge rock was thrown at my back behind me. I fell and the wind was taken from me. I could see my partner running while I tried grasping for air. 
I could see my partner running while I tried gasping for air. As I looked to where the rock could have come from, I was frozen out of fear. A seven foot tall black creature was standing in the tall grass before me. It was pale, wild with black eyes, just a slit for nostrils and a smile as big as its head. Its arms were far longer than they should have been for its size and its claws dripped with blood. I could only imagine where the blood came from. After just a few seconds, but it felt like an eternity, it took a step forward. I instantly came conscious then and reached for my rifle, hoping to defend myself with my bayonet. I stood up, legs trembling so badly that I felt like I would collapse. I ran. I ran as fast as I could. I could hear this creature behind me. It made a loud, heavy noise with every step that it took. I could feel this thing's breath on my neck. Too scared to turn around, I kept running until I reached my company. I nearly cried from the adrenaline rush and fright. They were wondering just what the hell was going on. They didn't see or hear anything chasing me, but I could see the fear in my partner's eyes. That night, they didn't make anyone else go on picket duty. I did not sleep that night, not a wink. Too scared that that creature would return. I stayed around the fire, not out of warmth, but security. When the morning arose, I found three six-inch long cuts in the back of my coat. When I had gotten the courage to go back to the scene with a few buddies, of course we found a dead deer where I was stationed. It had three cuts across its body. I decided to pack up and leave right then and there. The drive back home was silent. All I could think about was the creature. I did not get much sleep the nights afterward either, putting a toll on my grades. I barely passed the semester due to sleep deprivation. Finally, I decided to take a six-month break from reenacting to gather my confidence to sleep outside again. I know one thing is for sure, that I will never return to that reenactment ever again, fearing what I met will not be so merciful next time. The Stalker by Bubble Bus I was 16 years old, and my friends, Evan and Jake, wanted to rent a hotel room for the night since it was spring break. We got to the hotel and checked in. It had a funky smell, but we stayed there anyway. Once we got to our room, it was about 3 p.m., so we decided to go swimming. The pool was downstairs, departed from the hotel. Once we got to the entrance, there was a man that was at least 6 foot 3, in all black and a hood covering his face, just kind of facing us. I panicked a little bit, but not out loud. We got into the pool and swam for a few hours until we saw the man just sitting there in the chair, just staring at us. I cleared my throat. Can I help you, sir? I asked. We got no response. I still was a little paranoid, but my face, I put my face in the water and at the bottom of the pool there was another black figure. I screamed like a little girl and ran for the door. I looked back and saw nothing. Not the guy in the chair or anybody under the pool. My friends thought I was seeing things, but I thought what I saw was clear as day. I didn't feel like swimming anymore, so I decided to get dinner at a nearby restaurant. I got a table for my friends and me to sit at, and there I once again saw the man in all black on the other side of the dining room, staring at me once again. At this point, I have had enough. I went over there, lost track of him, and he took off. After we ate, I decided this trip has gone too far and we should leave tomorrow morning, but my friends didn't like that idea. Once it was 10.30, my friends and I dozed off in the hotel room. I woke up to some noises. I saw a shadow figure at the end of my bed. I calmed myself down and told myself that it was just my hat that I had put there before I went to bed. I went to bed and woke up again 30 minutes later to more noises. I was getting thirsty, so I reached under the bed and tried to grab my water bottle but I grabbed something and was shocked by what I had caught. It was my hat. I was now even more scared. I couldn't help but scream when I heard a voice by my ear say, You're a bitch. I jumped out of bed and realized there were two men right there, dressed all in black. I tried to fight them, but it was no use. Once they grabbed me and dragged me out of the room, I tried to scream, but the guy was covering my mouth. I passed out and woke up on a stretcher. Those guys knifed me while I passed out and someone caught them, but the doctor said no one could see the guys who had gotten me. To this day, I have a nightlight at night and I am always on guard. Rhode Island Sleepaway Camp by Anonymous. 
When I was younger, I would spend my summers at a sleepaway camp in a small town in Rhode Island. During changeover weekends, my mother would come pick me up and we would stay at her friend's house where she would do laundry and replenish my snack supplies before taking me back to the camp. Her friend had a large house across the street from a historic cemetery. She joked that she liked living there because the neighbors were quiet. The original house was three stories and had one old staircase carving up through it through the den next up to the kitchen and into the third floor, which was being used as a kid's space at the time. There were additions on the first and second floors and modern stairs on the side of the house. The modern additions were not haunted, that's for sure. But every one of my mom's friends and family claimed the kitchen in the old part of the house was indeed haunted by some sort of specter. That weekend, my mom slept in the den next to the kitchen, and I slept in the third floor slash attic slash kiss space. I am sensitive to the spirit world, at least I like to think so, but I also get scared easily. So when I went to sleep that night, I remember turning off a lamp before using the remote control to turn off the TV because I was much too afraid of the dark and wanted to not leave the covers at all. I wanted to be entirely covered when it was dark. I woke up the following day to the lamp shining down on me. I felt so guilty because I could have sworn I had turned it off. I hated wasting electricity. I told my mom about this while we drove back to the camp the next day. She suggested that it might have been her friend's daughter coming in in the middle of the night drunk and thinking she could crash up there. But I rationalized that she had her own room so it didn't make much sense. Then, my mother told me about what had happened to her in the night. First, they had been drinking wine and talking in the den before her friend made up my mom's bed. They got to talking about ghosts in the house. There was an apparition of a little girl who would appear in the kitchen rafters from time to time. As they were talking, her friend visibly blanched. She was looking through the door into her kitchen and she could see the little girl right then and there, sitting in the rafters, swinging her feet. Then they went to bed. The den had three doorways, the closed off former front door, the door to the kitchen, and the original wooden door with iron latch and hinges that led from the hole to the stairs that went up to where I was sleeping. My mom remembers feeling uneasy about that stairwell, closing that door and latching it. She awoke in the middle of the night to see the door opening and a shadowy figure of a woman standing in the doorway. She forced herself back to sleep, but the door was still available in the morning, wide open. She, she wondered if this, too, was the daughter coming home and not expecting guests. But again, all the family members lived in the new addition. She didn't have much of a reason to be where we were. We asked the daughter later and she denied being there. I think our presence stirred up something. In my memory, I can see the ghost going from the kitchen to the den up the stairs, wondering who these people were in her house. But of course, that is probably all my imagination. It had white dots for eyes by Trey B. Hello Swamp Dweller, my name is Trey and I have a story I want to share with everyone here. I live in central Pennsylvania and visit my grandparents in Baltimore, Maryland. I used to go the quickest way driving through a small community called Burnt Cabins. All you need to know about burnt cabins is that it gives me the creeps, and I hated going through it. Anyway, I was doing my monthly trip to Grandma and Grandpa's house a few years ago. I hung out with them for about two days before I drove home. I'd gotten about halfway there, and I, I was way later than I should have been, meaning I'd have to drive through burnt cabins at night. It was winter time, so I moved slowly in case of ice. While going through the town, I was trying not to creep myself out by the horrible vibe the place gives off when, from the right of my headlights, about 30 feet away, this tall and very skinny, pitch-black humanoid thing on all fours leaps into the road. I slammed on my brakes and came to a stop. I was glad there was an ice on the road, but this thing stared daggers at me. I remember it was very bony looking. I could make out its joints and vertebrae. This thing gave me the absolute creeps. It crawled up to my window like General Grievous from Star Wars and started tapping on the glass with his claw. That's when I knew this wasn't some guy in a black spandex suit messing around with me. It had no facial detail except for two tiny white dots where the eyes should be. 
No mouth, no nose, or anything else. After a couple of seconds of this thing tapping on my window, it started clawing at my window slowly but more aggressively, like it was trying to get in. Why, why didn't I just speed off? Who knows? Other than the screeching of its claws on the glass, it wasn't making a sound. To this day, I don't know what it wanted, why it was attacking me, or I guess seemingly trying to attack me. After a few minutes, it leaps out into the darkness like a giant demonic frog or something. I floored it off and drove, having little to no regard for the speed limit. I got home and my wife could immediately tell I was shaken up. She sat by the fireplace and held me in her arms saying, it's okay, I got you, while kissing me on my head. It took me a while to calm down. I tried explaining what I saw, but I just couldn't talk straight. Needless to say, I did find a new route to Baltimore, avoiding burnt cabins entirely. There was someone with us by Crazy P. Hello, Swamp Dweller. I just wanted to share my encounter with what I think was a paranormal experience. I live in Romania, in a small town in the northeast of the country. A few years ago, back between 5th and 6th grade, my old teacher wanted to do a camp with the whole class as it was last year seeing her. We stayed at a hotel with two different buildings. Half of the class was in the old building and half was in the new one. Me and two of my friends, let's call them Sarah and Gabby, stayed all three in a room on the last floor and on the right of our room were four other classmates. The first few days were quite normal activities and pool days, we were at the start of summer. Somewhere between the fourth and fifth day things began to change. It was night time and everyone was in their room with their door unlocked for our teacher to come and check if we were asleep. Me and Gabby slept in the double bed while Sarah slept alone in a small one. She didn't want to sleep alone so she pushed it to the end of ours. We usually slept with the TV on because we feared the dark. It never had a signal, so it was usually a casual white screen with many gray and black dots. Sarah asked if I could build something on a game as she was too tired to do it herself. I gladly accepted as I loved to make things. It was only me, her phone, and the TV sound. Gabby and Sarah were deeply asleep. I spent a few hours doing things on her phone until I got one of those creepy chills. I usually get them after I watch a horror movie or something. I started to get scared of the slightest things for no reason. I decided to stay awake for a little while longer until suddenly, Sarah sat in her bed and turned her head looking at me. I called a few times, and she didn't react. Hello, my name is Sarah. My heart dropped as soon as I heard her talk. I just sat there, staring at her, incapable of saying anything. That was it. I started holding my breath, scared that at any movement would cause her to do something crazy. She smiled at me, went back to sleep like nothing had ever happened. I hoped that that random thing she just did was because she was a sleepwalker or something like that. To escape that creepy situation, I put the phone on the table near the bed and turned around, facing the door and Gabby. I tried closing my eyes and ignoring the feeling of pure terror that caught me. Suddenly, I, I heard something else. Like someone was knocking on the window. The curtains were closed, so it was impossible to see who was there. Even if the hotels were in the middle of the forest, 10 minutes away from any city, there were no trees close enough to the hotel to make any noise like this. I gasped myself into believing that it was one of the boys from another class, as I knew they all do these kind of jokes to annoy people. Of course, if it was a person, it should have been, it should have been somebody who was locked on the balcony or somebody who magically flew up to one of ours. After a few seconds, I heard the hangers in the closet moving as if someone was in there moving around. And I started to tear up because there couldn't be any wind in the closet to cause that to happen. I touched Gabby, hoping she would wake up and stay with me for a while, but she didn't. After both the knocking and the movement stopped, I finally calmed down. Well, I calmed down too soon. Behind my back, there was a small bathroom. We usually never closed the door in case one of us wanted to go in the middle of the night and didn't want to wake up anyone with the noise that it caused. While staying silent, I started feeling steps going out of the bathroom near my bed. You know that feeling when your parents walk in the halls of your house and you know they're there because you can feel that, like, heaviness to it? That's precisely what I was feeling. It stopped right near me as, a, as if it was like examining me, you know? I don't even know how to explain this. 
Still, with my eyes closed, I faked turning around in my sleep to face the bathroom, and I shouted in my head multiple times to slightly open my eyes to see who it was. I knew there was no way it could be a human, but I prayed that in some way it was just somebody playing a prank on us. There was absolutely no one there when I opened my eyes to see who it could be. Absolutely no one. I started to panic, and you know, as a child, I pulled the cover over my head and went back to sleep thinking I was safe. Somehow, I did eventually fall asleep, and the following day, I woke up and told my friends what had happened. Sarah said she did not wake up, so she said it could have been some sort of sleepwalking moment, but she never had one until last night, at least that she knew of. Gabby said that everything that happened to me, she felt it too, so now I knew there was no way for it to be a nightmare. One of the girls next door in our room looking for something looked back at us with her eyes wide open and said she heard everything too. Now I'm in the 10th grade and to this day I still don't know what happened that night. Whenever I'm at my house or a friend's house, I always close the door to the bathroom. I'm sick of hearing people say that maybe I dreamt about it. Other people felt it too. There was no way it was a dream. Don't Follow the Faces in the Mist by S.F. Sundown Don't Follow the Faces in the Mist. It was a throwaway line, but one I should have listened to. We had finished up a block of training and our instructor, a wiry man everyone called Buck, invited us out for drinks. Most of the group joined, but a few stayed along. A lot of them were locals and had places to be. I was happy to have the company. As the night wore on, Buck's stern exterior came down. It is common enough to almost be a rule that sternness comes from a place of care and concern. Though sometimes misplaced, it was not so with Buck. His job was to prepare us for what we would face in our field and provide us with the tools to execute it as rangers. And he took it seriously. I was happy to have him as a teacher. At the end of the night, we said our goodbyes. He slapped down a hand on my shoulder and took in a breath. He lifted his head with his drooping eyelids and looked at me with a sustained intensity that shook clear the clouds of drunken mind. He said, The Smoky Mountains are a remarkable place, but promise me one thing. Don't follow the voices in the mist. It took me five years before I discovered why. The call came through in the early afternoon. A kid had wandered off from the campsite a few miles down the road from the ranger station. The situation is common enough. Someone had wandered off and couldn't find their way back or had managed to get themselves stuck. The majority of these calls resolve themselves the same day. We find the person and issue stern warnings. Hell, sometimes it is all over by the time we even get there, but not always. And no one in our station needed any reminding. Posted on the notice board beside the front door is a picture of Jessica. Her photo has been there for the entire five years I have worked at the station. She went missing the summer before I started. She is still there because we never found her. Jessica's father insisted the photo stay until she was either walking back out of the forest or the alternative no one wanted to give voice to. I know that photo better than any photo of my family or friends. Six-year-old Jessica with blonde hair spilling over her shoulders, fingertips poking out the sleeves of a red puffer jacket one size too big, a pair of bright yellow boots pushing up over faded denim jeans, and a big toothy open mouth smile. Her family took the photo the day that they arrived at the campsite. When the sun set on the search, her father had a copy printed and plastered all over the surrounding town. They were the clothes she had been wearing when she wandered off during the hike the family took up to the waterfall. The copy hanging on our notice board is the only one left. We pulled up to the campsite in our truck. A woman with a bright red beanie pushed down over dark hair was upon us as soon as we got out. She had her phone pressed to her ear and stuffed it in her pocket absentmindedly when she saw us. Adrenaline made her voice shrill and pushed her words together. Kyle nodded and added a few calm words to get her on track. His voice and manner are perfect for these situations. He didn't interrupt, he didn't raise his voice, he only slipped in enough words to get the information we needed. Her name was Polly, she was six years old, she had been wearing a red beanie like her mother's and had faded brown jacket on. It had been passed down through the family. She had dark brown hair and brown eyes, and where was she last seen? Well, where they were hiking was up to that same waterfall and they planned to have a picnic up there. When they made it to the top, the mist had come in so thick they couldn't see anything of the view. That combined with the chill in the air convinced them to come back down. The four had walked together, mother, father, older brother Will and Polly. She had been up there with them when they made it down. On that point, both mother and father agreed 
Will had shrugged his shoulders. At the campsite, the air was clear and the fall sun warmed our shoulders. Up the mountain could very well be a different story though, and it likely was. They somehow left Polly behind the walk back. We got a vehement no. She came down off the mountain. Somehow, in the time between coming back down and setting up the picnic at the fold-out table beside the camper, Polly had wandered off. It wasn't like her, she was a good girl. As we listened, a small crowd circled us at the distance. Because it was the middle of the day, most of the campers were off walking a trail or sightseeing in one of the nearby towns. The ones that were around, elderly couples on retirement and families on holiday, picked themselves up off their deck chairs and came to see about the commotion. No one had seen little Polly, though. Kyle split us into two teams. The first was to search down and around the campsite, the most likely place she would be. At the back of the campsite, a tree-lined creek meandered down the mountain. Beyond the terrain was rough, grass-covered hills and gullies filled with thick bushes. If she had ventured out there, a slip could send her tumbling into a stack of reeds and no one would see her. The second team was to go back up the trail, retrace the steps the family had taken to come down. It was unlikely, but sometimes people had what Kyle called a McAllister moment. This is when a parent is sure their child is or isn't with them, and they are wrong. It is the sort of thing that leads to parents leaving their children in cars on hot days, and famously a family named the McAllisters leaving their child home alone to stave off some would-be thieves at Christmas time. Mark and I ended up on the team heading up the trail. I'll admit I was a little disappointed. Like Kyle, I was sure Polly was somewhere around the campsite. It is a selfish thought, but on a search you always wanted to be the one who finds the person. I was sure now that it wouldn't be me. We started up the trail, leaving the campsite in the search effort behind. Before we left, the mother had shown us a photo of Polly taken up at the waterfall. I kept the picture in my head as we walked. I hoped we wouldn't be adding it to the notice board. The trail was eerily quiet. I had walked it many times and always come across people powering up or coming back down. Not today. The trees surrounded us on all sides, and the world went silent. We walked slowly, scanning through the forest on either side and calling out her name. We hadn't gone far when the mist came in, thicker and faster than usual. When you live up this way, you get used to it. There's a reason they're called the Smokies, after all. Before long, visibility was down to only a few yards. I stopped and looked back down the trail. It was no better than the visibility ahead. It almost seemed unnatural how quickly and completely the mist had arrived. I was about to say I had never seen anything like it when Mark took the words right out of my mouth. It was comforting that it wasn't just me. No wonder the family had turned back. The ferocity of the mist gave rise to a terrible thought. Polly may be up here in the forest somewhere. It would be easy for a child to wander off or even to stop to fumble with a stray shoelace for just long enough to get separated from her family. The parents had been sure she made it down, but then there was the McAllister effect. I called ahead to Mark, who had walked on ahead. When I received no response, I skipped a few paces to catch up. As an adult and knowing the area as well as I did, there was still a moment of fear when being alone spiked in my stomach. I could only imagine what Polly was going through if she was up here all alone. Mark had stalled up on the trail ahead. He turned as he heard my footsteps and pointed out to the right. He thought he heard something. I squinted through the mist, but saw nothing. He couldn't give me any other details, only that something had caught the corner of his eye as soon as he was about to turn his head. I stepped into the trees and called after Polly. A few steps more and I stopped and listened. Nothing. Back on the trail, Mark was fixed in place. His face had gone pale. It, it moved, he said. What did? Th the mist. I turned behind and then back to Mark. I waited for a punchline or for him to break into a smile, but none came. Let's keep going. I found myself on edge. The mist enclosing us had a sudden menace to it. As we climbed it, it only grew thicker. I buttoned up my coat, and against the cold, it was like being high in the air and inside a cloud. We walked in silence. I called out after Polly half-heartedly. When I noticed Mark was no longer by my shoulder, I stopped and turned. I strode back down until I found him standing like a statue. He shook his head at me. He wanted to go down. I grabbed his arm and told him we had to keep going. It was our job and if Polly was up here, she was relying on us to find her. Mark is a big guy, but at that moment he looked small and fragile. He looked up to the sky and then back to me. He nodded and we continued. Up ahead, the trail turned to the left. As we approached, the bend shapes started to appear in the mist. At first, I took them to be the outline of branches leaning over the trail. 
but as we came closer, the outline stretched and deformed like clouds changing shape under a high wind. The shape coalesced into something that vaguely resembled the outline of a small child. I blinked my eyes and refocused and it was still there. The outline of a child running away from us, around the bend in the trail. I broke into a run and rounded the bend chasing after the shape in the mist. On the other side there was nothing, only a blank wall of mist like before. Had I just imagined it, was my mind playing tricks? I turned to Mark to check if he had seen it, but Mark was not there. I ran back to the bend and rounded it again in the other direction. Mark? I ran a few more steps and still nothing. Mark? I called out again and again and again, but there was only silence. He was just there a second ago. He had been beside me when the bend came into view. I was sure of it. Or had he? We had walked in silence. Had he flaked, turned back, and left me alone? Surely not. Mark was a reliable guy. He wouldn't do that to me. Maybe I had a McAllister moment. But then, where was he? Mark? I called again and again. I ran 50 yards back down the trail and nothing. I stood with my hands on my hips, unsure of what to do next. I didn't want to walk back to the campground without Mark. I also didn't want to hike further up the trail alone. A pocket of warm air washed over me and back over my neck. It was as if someone pushed their mouth right up against my skin and exhaled. I snapped my head around and no one was there. I almost called out again for Mark and thought better of it. I took a few steps back up the trail towards the bend where I'd seen the shapes in the mist. On my left where the rustle of leaves and a sharp crack of a twig snapped. I stopped and peered through the mist in the trees. Something in there moved. I leaned forward. A few feet above the base of a tree, a small pocket of mist turned into a circle. As I neared it, it coalesced into a face. The face of a child. A small girl. Polly. I jumped forwards and the face pulled back further into the forest. I called out to the girl and followed her into the forest. If she was up here, I had to look. I had to be sure. Soon, trees surrounded me. The mist hung as heavy around the trees as it had done on the trail. I looked left and right, searching for the face I had seen or thought I had seen. No, it had to have been there. There again, up ahead, the vague outline of a small girl. I put the picture of Polly back into my head so that I knew that it was her. Red beanie, faded brown jacket, dark hair and brown eyes. But as much as I tried to picture Polly, it was the other girl, Jessica, from the photo on the notice board that I saw. The blonde hair, the red puffer jacket and that big smile. I couldn't shake the image. I followed the face of the girl in the mist. I skipped a few steps to catch up, but she disappeared. I stood panting a little and called out, and there she was directly ahead standing in a small clearing. Red puffer jacket and blonde hair, six-year-old Jessica. Six-year-old Jessica who disappeared five years ago and was now here still six years old. I squeezed shut my eyes and shook my head. When I opened them, she was still there smiling up at me with that big goofy grin. I trembled. This shouldn't be. It was Polly I was searching for, dark hair, red beanie. I'm looking for Polly, I said and immediately felt foolish. The child looked up at me confused and the smile was gone. She turned a circle on the spot and when her face came back into view, her face was different. Not only was her face not there anymore, it was now dark and she manifested a red beanie. It was Polly now where it had been Jessica a second ago. Polly? I said. She made the same goofy smile as Jessica had in her photo. I shook my head and almost yelled at her. You are not real. This can't be real. The grin faded again and her mouth twisted into a grotesque snarl. Her mouth opened wide and then wider still unnaturally so and her crooked child's teeth morphed into razor sharp fangs. The moment before I turned to run I locked with the creature's eyes, yellow and menacing. I raced through the trees desperately seeking the trail. I swung my head around and in the mist a wall of faces closed in from behind. I gave an involuntary yelp and forced myself to look away. When I finally found the trail, I turned and ran at full speed down into. When I finally found the trail, I turned and ran full speed down in toward the campsite. Mark be damned, I didn't want anything to do whatever with whatever. Mark be damned, I didn't want anything to do with whatever was hiding in the forest. I turned back and before I could process anything, I hit a wall in the trail and tumbled to the ground. It was Mark. I scrambled to my feet and Mark stared at me with eyes filled with terror. Did you see it? I didn't answer him. I grabbed him by the arm and started down the trail. We had to get down. Mark made a noise, a half laugh, half cry, and I turned and followed his outstretched hand. There, standing near the trees, was Polly. But it wasn't Polly. She stood there and watched us with an arm held out, beckoning us into the forest. 
Don't look at it. I fixed my eyes on the trail ahead, trying to give myself tunnel vision. In my imagination, the faces sprung up again on each side. I covered my head and yelled at them to stop, and then as if someone flicked a switch, I felt the warmth of the sun on my face. I looked up and saw the blue of the sky. We were out of it. We slowed to a walk. When we came back to the playground, Kyle asked us if we were okay. He could see that we were shaken up. I didn't know how to explain what we had seen, so I told him that we did not find Polly. The team at the base had not found her either. I am convinced of two things. Polly went missing on that trail somewhere in the mist, and whatever we saw was not her. There is a second photo hanging on our notice board. Polly has joined Jessica, two girls taken by something lurking in the mist. North Dakota Horror by Andy J. This happened to some of my friends and me during the summer of 2021 after my high school graduation. I'm from a small town in North Dakota, and my buddies and I are the stereotypical rednecks of the city. You know, the type who drive loud trucks and is always armed somehow. We were doing what most teenagers do for fun in the Midwest, driving around and shooting signs. When we got low on ammunition, one of my friends, we'll call him Gary, recommends we check out this snowmobiling warming hut where he's experienced some paranormal activity. Now my buddies and I are all Christians and are very religious, but we couldn't pass up an opportunity like this either because we were also buzzed or because we were just dumb teenagers with nothing to do. So we arrive at the old shack and sit in my other buddies, who will call him Larry, F-150 truck. We turn off the headlights and the dash lights and look and listen. Even though I didn't believe in the paranormal at the time and was skeptical, I felt reassured that I had my AK with me. It's important to note that it is hot for a North Dakota evening and extremely dark out. We were all content, feeling good, and someone in the back seat suddenly said it felt like we were being watched. After he said that, I flipped the safety off my AK and tried to be aware as possible. Then he shouted, Holy crap! In the most terrified, helpless voice I'd ever heard come out of him, he tells us to look in Larry's rearview mirror. What I saw was genuinely horrifying. In this rearview mirror, this glowing white figure stands about 7 or 8 feet tall. It's only about 30 yards away from us, peeking behind a tree. Larry immediately turns his truck on and throws it in reverse to get a better look, but just as abruptly as it had appeared, it was instantly gone. I fired a few rounds in its general direction, and immediately after I did, the air got freezing cold. After that, Larry floored it, tearing out of there like the Dukes of Hazard. We were all spooked to our bones, but one of my buddies, we'll call him Barry, says he saw nothing. Now, the white figure was terrifying, but the creepiest part is why Barry didn't see it when all the rest of us did. The Cage in the Wood by Yes, I'm Fluffy 99. At the time, I was a 20 year old female who had just moved to a small upstate town. I had grown up in a slightly larger town about 60 miles away and just wanted a new start. I love camping and often go camping in the Adirondacks, but at the time, I hadn't yet made friends to go camping with, so I wasn't going to go into the real woods alone, if you know what I mean. Down the road from me, I had been walking around and found an area where the power lines cut through a wooded section. The power lines were perpendicular to the road. It was near a house, but far enough to the right to the place where I don't think anybody would see me if they were walking the trail that the power lines made. I'm not sure about other countries, but in the United States, they keep power lines clear in case of maintenance. So I wander up there, noticing how it's pretty deep woods, and how far I can get away from the house that I saw on the road they couldn't possibly think I'm trying to break in. And then, bing, I get an idea. I could go camping up here. It's secluded enough to give the natural woods experience, but close enough to the road that I wouldn't be in danger of wildlife or anything like that. So, I do. I set up camp in this little clearing that I accessed by climbing the hill, following the power lines, then turned left onto what seemed to be some sort of deer trail. Deer are absolutely everywhere in New York. Then I came upon this lovely flat, grassy clearing. After clearing the dead wood away, I built my fire off to the side. I'm feeling brilliant and independent. It was creepy to sleep in the woods alone, sure, as I had always had at least one camping companion. But hey, whatever. New experiences build new skills, you know? I wandered further down the path the next day to see where it led. 
I walked for about an hour, and I can see some fields on the right, but they are in the distance, and there is a fence between the fields and the path. So again, I figure people can't be mad for me being here. Then I come across another path. Heading to the right, I follow it. A couple of feet in, it curves slightly, and there's an old van to the left of the path. Well, that's strange. But it's about 1 p.m. near noon anyway, in broad daylight, and the birds are chirping. So I don't really feel in danger. I go up to the van, which had been there for a very long time, clearly. It was like a 70s style make, it made me kind of think of Scooby-Doo, and there were overgrown weeds all around it. There are streaks of brownish red going down the side from the bottom of the doors. I looked in and saw what appeared to be an old bedding or something in the back, but it was all shredded up and the curtains in the windows were shredded as well. There was clothing strewn about, it looked like the clothing was from the 70s or early 80s, I still felt no danger per se. Snickering at the terrible fashions back in the day, I continued along the path for a short time, until I finished rounding another slight bend. I stopped dead in my tracks, finally. My reptile sense went off, or whatever you call it. I wake the hell up, and it, it, I'm just, my head is screaming at a total volume that I've never heard before. Up ahead, there is this creepy-ass doll hanging from the tree by its neck with a noose. Not just stuck in the trees, but just left there as it was hanging. It was terrifying, to say the least. To the right of it, though, there was this huge cage-like structure, easily big enough to hold a full-sized human. It seems to be made up of pipes and other long metal objects just welded together. Some were up, some were down, some were across, and the squares they made weren't big enough to fit my head through, let alone anything else. Not that I tried, anyway. It had four sides and a ceiling. It had other creepy-ass dolls hanging from it. It also had reddish-brown stains running down the sides, just like the van. Further behind it in the distance was a run-down house. Creeped out as hell, I just turned tail and ran. I am not a runner by any means, I am a chunky girl, and I have smoked for more than six years, and I do not run. But I ran that day. I don't even remember the run, and I remember coming up upon my campsite, grabbing my tent in one swoop as I ran past. Luckily, I had put all my things into the tent. Ripping it out of the ground as I continued running, I left my cooler, my food, and all that stuff behind. I never went back for it either, and sometimes I kind of feel bad about that though. I dropped the tent stakes along the way and had to repair rips in my tent. I tore down that hill. I'm still surprised it didn't break my neck or ankle. Jumped in my car and sped home. I locked all my doors, then paced my house going, what the hell, what the hell, what the hell, for hours. It's been 11 years since that incident, and even typing it now makes my hands shake. I currently live almost 1,400 miles away, but I still made sure my doors were locked. And they are. The crazy thing is, is, I wasn't even that deep in the woods. Maybe in the 1970s it would have been, who knows. As it stands now though, people live within a short walk of this place. And no, I know you will ask, I did not call the cops. I can't articulate why. My best analysis looking back is that I didn't want the creep to find me. I should have probably called them at the very least. You are probably right there. I hope it was an old crime scene and not some sick man who still keeps people in cages in the woods. Thanks for listening to these creepy and allegedly true small town horror stories that'll freak you out tonight. If you enjoyed these stories, please be sure to subscribe and hit that like button as it helps a ton. The more likes this episode gets, the more YouTube promotes it to fresh new eyes. The more people that subscribe, the more the swamp grows, and that's incredibly helpful. If you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit yours at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I would love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. You can also submit it at reddit at r slash the dark swamp. If you're on the go but don't have YouTube premium but still want to download and listen to your favorite swamp dweller scary stories no matter where you are, you can actually download them absolutely free from Spotify, Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, and pretty much everywhere you find your favorite podcast online. If you made it all the way to the end, I would love to know what story is your favorite tonight. It helps me pick better stories for the future. Again, if you have a story, be sure to send it in. I'd love to share it. If you made it to the end, once again, today's code word is pink can. Be sure to use that in the comments to confuse anybody who didn't make it to the end. The funniest comment will be pinned at the top. Thank you guys as always. I'll see you soon with another creepy episode. Be sure to join me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all the good social medias, and I'll see you soon.